Hello there, my name is Dennis and I've been in the company for the last four years. I've been serving a role of IVI applications team lead for the last, for the last year uh, and recently uh, I've been replacing Tomislav as a software development manager. He is going back to development. So basically one of my first tasks in the new role is answering your questions which you asked Tomislav. Okay, so you're ready for the questions? Here comes the first one. What different computer languages do you guys use for the autonomous driving system, the torque acting system, the UX design, and the software system? Where basically the software de development department is mostly high-level software, so I would answer those questions about the, the high-level software, and I can say that the, so the high-level software is split it into, uh, let's say, two pieces, in-vehicle and off-vehicle software. In vehicle, we differentiate the OS level and the application level, and off vehicle, we differentiate the telematics and the mobile development. So within the vehicle, uh, on the OS, which is custom-based Linux, we use the pure C, some of the C++, uh, and uh, a lot of Bash and uh, Python scripting. While in the application layer, we are using the Qt framework, so mostly uh, doing the backend in C++ and frontend in QML and JavaScript. Uh, off-vehicle part of the software, so let's say about telematics, we are using the uh, Node.js, Java, and uh, Scala in the backend field, and React uh, on, the, on the front end. Uh, regarding the mobile department, we are uh, developing uh, native iOS and Android applications, so Swift and Kotlin. Uh, and not to forget our split R&D department, which are doing the diagnostic software and uh, on top of everything I already mentioned, they're using the C-sharp in the .NET framework. Uh, regarding other questions, you asked about the um, autonomous driving and a torque vectoring. Uh, as I said, that's not part of our uh, department, but for what I know, they're using a lot of MATLAB and Python, but maybe some of the colleagues from their department couldn't answer that better than me. Okay, next question. Apart from hardcore C++, do you use other program language like Python, Java, and how do you integrate program into the car? Is programming difficult or easy from your side because I'm a beginner at Python, C, and C++? Please give me some cool tips to learn these languages more quickly. Well, as I said, we're uh, using a uh, vast majority of languages, so basically uh, a lot of uh, cutting-edge technologies today and we are also always open to some new technologies, new languages. So as I mentioned in the previous question, you can find a lot of that here. To answer the second part of the question, how do you deploy the software to the vehicle, uh, is basically like this. So since we're using the, the Qt framework, which is by its nature cross-platform, and we are um, de developing the application to build it for the device target, which is an infotainment system. So that would be an analogy like you're having the Raspberry Pi module, let's say, something like that. Uh, so the, the software uh, gets cross-compiled for that platform. And how we do the very deployment, it's, let's say, a three-step procedure, I would say. So first, the, the software is deployed on the target device on the desk because you have to test it on the desk after, after you uh, release some feature. Then we have something we call multiplex. Uh, it's basically the whole vehicle system uh, in, in one room, so you can, you can actually integrate the infotainment with all other ECUs. ECUs are electronic control units, so basically car has around 70 units, and the infotainment has to interact with all of those. Uh, after we deploy the, the, the software on the multiplex, uh, and we tested that it's all, let's say, correct and functional, then we do the actual deployment to the vehicle. And uh, there's a three, three ways how can you deploy software on the vehicle. So, over the Ethernet, uh, that's how we do it during the development. It's quite easy, you, you cross-compile the project and you deploy it on, on, on the target device. Second is over the USB update, so we have a bootable, uh, USB, uh, bootable OS image on the USB and we can um, deploy the whole operating system with, with the application over the USB or over the air or over the, uh, over the internet. So that's basically how the vehicle is supposed to be updated in the production. Okay, uh, for the third part of your question, which probably interests you the most, is some cool tips to learn the languages quickly. Well, 
uh, actually, uh, the coolest tip I can give you is to open your favorite IDE and your favorite um, internet browser and just start typing and just start Googling. Because if you don't know, Google knows. And basically, you need just uh, time and will. And if you like doing that, if you like your job, if you like programming, you would never feel hustle doing it. So basically, that's the best tip I can give you. Third question. What programming pairing you guys use the most? Procedural, object-oriented, or functional? And do you guys use any open source software or libraries, or planning on open sourcing any of FreeMath's software? Regarding the programming paradigms we use, functional, uh, object-oriented, or procedural, I would say we use all three. Because as I mentioned earlier, the um, uh, OS level, uh, we will we would use uh, mostly functional programming. In the application level on the infotainment, we would use most uh, OOP. Uh, and uh, on the telematics backend, uh, with, with those, we would also use uh, functional paradigm uh, in Scala. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, cutting-edge design patterns we are using. So for the GUI, we're using uh, MVP, MVVM, MVC, MVI. Um, uh, infotainment backend is um, folded as a microservice architecture, so you have um, service applications for each context area, and they're uh, communicating between the, each other uh, across the ZeroMQ interprocess communication protocol. Uh, we're using GraphQL on our backend to communicate with the clients uh, and so on. So I would say we are quite broad and we're not close-minded, so we're open to all cutting-edge technologies you can find nowadays. Regarding the open source software or libraries, yeah, we're using a lot of open source libraries, some of them, some of commercial as well. Uh, and um, you asked also about open sourcing our software, and that's something that we are really looking into, uh, to open source some tools and some libraries that we use within our projects. Of course, we cannot, do, uh, we cannot open source anything that's uh, project-specific and confidential and under NDA, but yeah, we're actively uh, planning to open source some of our tooling and libraries and for you guys to contribute and maybe join our team, why not? Fourth question. What software environment are you using for the entertainment system? Short and slick. So we're using the embedded Yocto Linux distro with Qt framework, uh, or I would say boot to Qt distribution on top of it. So our infotainment system is built with Qt. Uh, we are looking into some other technologies like Android or Unity, but that's something for the future. Uh, we are using embedded Linux and Qt. In today's world of hackers, how is Rimats preventing hacking of the connected car and the systems? Actually, I have one more similar question, so I read that as well. What would be a smart approach on preventing bad actors from doing bad things to your car while you're driving? Similar to what they show in a crappy Hollywood movies, when hackers take in control of a car or cause accidents on purpose. Some standalone built-in safety checks encryption. Okay. So first of all, I must say that there is no bulletproof solution when it comes to security. There is no uh, definition that something is secure or not. You have to take all the systems and all the, all, all the scenarios into consideration. I can say that we are uh, investing heavily into security and we are really uh, defining all the possible scenarios that, that, that could happen and how to protect from those. Imagine buying a $10 wooden cabinet and putting a $50,000 retina scan lock to secure it. I mean, you, so you invested heavily into uh, securing something that by its own definition is quite unsecure and whatever you have inside uh, is basically not secure enough, right? Because the thief won't pick a lock, he would just break the cabinet. Uh, so what can I say that first thing that you have to do before uh, starting anything regardless of security is defining three things. First, uh, access points. So from which points the attacker can invade the system, right? Uh, in, in, in the field of, uh, let's say, a vehicle that could, a connected vehicle that could be a uh, debug port, that could be a CAN bus, that could be a mobile network or uh, over the air update package or whatever. Second is threat modeling. 
or writing a scenarios uh, on uh, how can attacker attack the system and actually like a stories, what could happen to invade a certain access point. And third, defining the safe zones. So, uh, or I would say a checkpoints after which you can say that this uh, threat model is clear and you're uh, basically safe at this point. So, as I said earlier, we first have to identify what are the entry points to the system. So, in a connected vehicle, uh, that could be a mobile app, that could be an OBD port on the car, uh, that could be Ethernet port. Let's take mobile app, uh, for example. You park your car in front of a bar, you take a few beers, left your mobile phone on the counter, go to the bathroom, someone sits next to you, takes your mobile phone, unlocks the vehicle and goes away. So, you identified uh, a scenario which can uh, potentially be a security breach. After you uh, identify it, you can then act accordingly to prevent that from happening. How would you do that in this case? Well, you have to, uh, you, you, you have to make the, the security solution on the mobile app, uh, on the very mobile app, on the very mobile phone. Uh, so what would you do? You would introduce the fingerprint scan authorization or the face ID or uh, PIN uh, number activation. So basically, once you figure out what's the threat model, you can uh, work on the solution. Other example would be a faulty uh, over-the-air update package. So you can identify uh, the threat on two ways. Someone uh, made a security breach into the Remax backend, where the over-the-air update packages are stored, or someone uh, made a breach into the infotainment system and changed the, the, changed the server address from where the updates are um, supposed to be downloaded. So once you identify the threat model, you can then uh, work on the solutions. So in first situation, you would introduce the two-factor authorization, you would introduce uh, all, uh, other safety mechanisms that you have to do to comply um, the security of the backend. In the second case, you would uh, figure out that only signed update images with remote certificate are supposed to run on the infotainment. Uh, so if you don't have a signed package, the IVI becomes unusable. So basically, uh, that's all about it. Defining what are the entry points, what are the scenarios that someone can breach through those entry points, and then work on the solution case by case. Okay, so that was it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the answers. And please, if you like what we do, we have a lot of open positions here at Rimac. Please check out our career page and help us shape the future of mobility.